No, as the president, I've practiced law in uh, Eastern Kentucky about 30 years. And um, we've seen a lot in, in that particular subject matter, and, and we've seen it such live. When we decided to do this, uh, Senate Bill 80, and get involved in the legalization of cannabis, I didn't just arrive at that willy-nilly. Now, I did this all of a sudden one day, let's go do that. What I did was, I said, we said together, let's send a team of four out to Colorado and see what they're doing and what mistakes they made and go out there and talk to the fellow that sponsored the original legislation, what mistakes they might have made. So if we were inclined to do that, we wouldn't make the same mistakes. And I agree with the president uh, from my work on the juvenile death penalty, and many of you all were here then. Um, a male, young male's brain does not fully develop before 25, 26. There's a lot of studies on that. The Supreme Court took that part uh, with the juvenile death penalty issue. And I, I, I don't think, uh, I think you can take judicial notice of that before. Take note of what? Our brain takes many years to fully develop. That's not news to anybody. Every American child learns this in middle school. But what they don't learn is that our bodies actually require a mixture of CBD and THC during development, which every new mother produces and passes it through her breast milk. Cannabidiol deficiencies have been linked to a number of preventable disorders. And I'll tell you something that I've seen recently with marijuana, and you can look it up. It's a real phenomenon. It's a real disorder. And it's hard to watch somebody you love go through it. And um, it's uh, cannabis psychosis of um, young people who do this thing called dabbing. I would ask you all to research on that, it's not the band. Cannabis psychosis? Psychosis. A severe mental disorder in which thoughts and emotions are so impaired that contact is lost with external reality. Psychosis, most of the time, shows itself in young adults and teenagers. Imagine that. Go ahead and look up marijuana psychosis. In every study I have read about this, at best they can do is claim marijuana may play a small part in psychosis, and the only way it can be linked is by admission and consumption. Marijuana psychosis may sound scary and official, but it's nothing more than psychosis with marijuana attached to it to strike fear in the audience it's being told to. At the end of the day, it's psychosis, and it's a mental disorder that anybody from any walk of life can become victim of. On this chart, we can see that psychosis falls under the same category of illnesses as depression and bipolar disorder. Both of them have been treated with great success with marijuana and tons of research to prove it. Concentrations aren't like back then when we were in college. They're like 200 times the, uh, the selective breeding of, of the plant and uh, certain uh, other innovations in the industry. Come on. 200 times stronger with selective breeding. Let's say they had plants producing 15% THC back in her college days. Multiply 15 by 200 and we get 3,000. Does anybody really believe a cannabis plant or any plant can be made up of 3,000% of any one component? 3,000% THC sounds like reefer madness to me. The method of preparation and now the form of use has brought on a whole new area of concern for this practitioner, legal practitioner, and uh, policymaker. Method of preparation is concerned. Cannabis can help millions. Cannabis reform can save lives. And abolishing the prohibition of cannabis can, in fact, lead to saving our communities billions of dollars a year and free up law enforcement so they can fight real crimes. The methods of preparation she speaks of, even though it's so misunderstood by her, is already happening. Prohibition hasn't stopped this in 80 years, and it's not going to stop it now. 
Lack of action on her part as a policymaker is literally killing people and providing millions of attorneys like herself a pretty nice career. I'm sure a nonviolent criminal is more of a desired client to defend in court than a murderer or rapist. And I would just think that uh, this new phenomenon certainly needs to be part of that debate uh, because I'm going to have a real hard time enabling uh, the young men and women of uh, below the age of what I think is a falsehood in the midst of uh, to be subjected more to make this legal. I think we need to do a lot of research on it. I'm convinced that if we should legalize this product, that we will save some lives. There are 20,000 studies out there. Canada has studied it. Colorado has studied it. 34 states have studied it. Six countries in South America have studied it. Israel has studied it. Thailand has studied it. Most of Europe has studied it. Once again, the research BS pops up. The research has been done, and if you really want to help your community, you have to quit avoiding this issue until it affects you or a loved one. This only leads to poor decisions based off emotion and fear. But make the decision then about what you consider with knowledge rather than fear. Thank you very much. Your constituents want this. They need this. And you are allowing your personal bias and lack of knowledge to prevent this from happening. Because it's been for us to find on, uh, on me in, in a way that um, as a family member uh, and um, it changed my whole perspective. No matter what you do as a policymaker or attorney at law, you will always have people creating a concoction of chemicals that produce extreme highs in death. Marijuana in its natural form is what is being proposed in the bills that are being introduced, not a concoction of chemicals that make up dabs. Those chemicals already exist and are also regulated without success. You must be 21 years old to purchase the butane used in dabbing. And to be quite clear, the butane in a dab is far worse than the cannabis extract in a product. And it's very real and uh, I, I see it being a real problem for the Commonwealth uh, and, and the uh, mental health crisis. The research has been done and it has proven over and over that removing the prohibition of marijuana in state after state has reduced deaths, saved millions of dollars annually, improved the quality of life of hundreds of thousands, and prevented families from being ripped apart because a family member wasn't thrown in jail because they consumed marijuana. I'm sorry her family is going through a tough time with a family member that may be struggling with some form of addiction and or mental illness, but research has shown that cannabis isn't the root cause. Blaming cannabis for doing something to someone is no different than saying guns kill people, not the people choosing to pull the trigger. And we need to be very careful where we tread with the innovation going on in the cannabis industry at this time. Thank you all mental health crisis, and the cannabis industry. The cannabis industry is being recreated all across the country. And yes, I said recreated. Despite the efforts to eradicate cannabis through prohibition, the cannabis industry has thrived, probably the most lucrative industry in the world. Prohibition has only caused blood to be shed, lives destroyed, and billions upon billions wasted that otherwise could have been going towards creating beautiful, safe communities all across the U.S. Marijuana gets blamed for the mental health crisis all the time, when it's really just another anecdotal approach at solving a problem we don't understand. Marijuana doesn't cause the underlying problem to affect the subject or their families. Parents and psychologists all across the world are so scared of marijuana that anytime they find out their disobedient teenager is using marijuana, they automatically blame the cannabis, even though there is plenty of evidence to disprove that theory. Why is this? Marijuana was widely accepted as a medicinal tool and beneficial to our bodies prior to 1937. And since the push to ban marijuana and eliminate it from existence, certain industries have created very effective tactics to strike fear in the minds of those subjectable to propaganda-based lies. And unfortunately, we are a society that assumes we are knowledgeable enough to make a quick decision about everything based off our very little understanding about a subject. 
As a policymaker, it is your job to listen to those constituents that put you in that position. Voting based on your limited knowledge will and has caused harm to those you're supposed to be protecting. The studies have been read by your constituents and the numbers are in. Your obligation is not to appease your limited, fearful conscience. Your obligation is to your community, to their will.